Our expert is Dr. Evelyn Horn. She is the Director of Heart Failure and Pulmonary Hypertension at the Perkin Heart Center at Weill Cornell Medical College. I had the opportunity not so long ago to sit down with Dr. Horn to discuss this exciting technology and ventricular assist devices. Evelyn, despite great advances in medicines, end-stage heart failure is still a terrible prognosis, as bad as any cancer. What are you doing to help change this? Aside from calling myself a cardiac oncologist, we're fortunate to be living in an era of mechanical circulatory support devices. This is devices that are used for three major categories when we talk about LVADs. One is short-term, bridge to recovery. One is a bridge to transplantation for patients who need a heart transplant but are too sick to wait without the help of a device or for a certain blood type groups, blood type O, A positive, large frame people where the wait is enormously longer that they need this. And lastly, we've moved to an era where we use it as destination therapy. That means that instead of getting a transplant, they live with this device. Well, destination therapy is so exciting, but in general, what patients should we as cardiologists be thinking about to refer to you for these devices? So in essence, when is a patient sick enough and when is a patient too sick? And to begin with the definitions of when we need to emergently go in for a device, sometimes the surgeons call us um, because they really can't come off of the bypass pump. Other times, it's really a state of end-stage heart failure with multi-organ system, dis with imminent multi-organ system dysfunction that require some support to go in, occasionally incessant ventricular arrhythmias. So VT storms in some patients necessitate support because there's nothing else to be done. But the biggest number are really those who are just the progressive insidu insidious advancing decompensated heart failure, who have now failed all of the therapies, medical therapies, uh, resynchronization therapy, and needing to come into the hospital. And essentially, patients who are sick enough to need inotropic therapy should be considered candidates for device therapy. Well, what are the more specific indications for device implantation? So amongst the candidates would be those patients who really, with hemodynamic monitoring, we know their cardiac index is, for instance, less than two, the right atrial, they have wedge pressures that are greater than 20. This is all despite the best medical management persistent hypoten hypotension where their blood pressures are less than 90, evidence of worsening renal function, liver function test abnormalities, diagnosis of certain types of myocarditis would push us very quickly to do this support. And again, anything that's really marginal hemodynamics in a large frame person who is going to have to wait too long for a transplant. What patients might not be candidates for this? What are the exclusion criteria for device implantation? So the biggest issue as a team effort here is we don't want to convert a medical death to a surgical death. This, these patients are going through open heart surgery, are going to have all of the complications surgically, which means the potential for multi-organ system dysfunction, kidneys, liver, coagulopathy, bleeding problems, the other thing you have to remember is that they need social support at home. This is a device. They can't be scared of this. Somebody in the house has to be there. We could never do it in somebody who lives alone, who has no friends or family. You need the social support structure that we have, that we insist on for a heart transplantation. So it really isn't for everything, for everybody. Um, it is for the appropriate patient population. And once again, you're bringing up the importance of collaboration between surgeons and cardiologists and clinical cardiologists and patients and their families, which is an extremely important part of this. And psychiatrists and social workers yes. and physical therapists and nurse practitioners. This is very much a commitment of a whole team to move forward here. Very good. When you have a patient who qualifies, how do you know which device to use? Well, one Amongst the questions we have to ask are one, what is the indication? Is it a short-term device? Is it a long-term device? Is it a patient who needs a right ventricular assist device? Or is it a patient who can do well enough with just a left ventricular assist device? If a patient is a bridge to transplant, then we do have devices that can be used for biventricular support. 
If it's a patient who is a destination therapy, the only approved devices are isolated left ventricular assist devices. So it very much depends on a combination of issues of patient size. Again, fortunately now we have smaller devices again. The first generation wouldn't have fit in many a woman or in a child. Now we have these options. Is it a patient who needs the support of a right ventricular assist? And I also go with what the surgicals, what the surgeon's desire is, because again, you want the surgeon to also choose a device that they are comfortable working with. And depending if it's a short term or long term, we have to also raise questions of use of anticoagulation, of durability of devices, and method of uh, method to which the devices are actually implanted. Clearly, these technologies are being developed rapidly, and the smaller size does make them accessible to a larger patient population, including women, and the experiences growing there. Tell us about the most recent information we have from the HeartMate 2 device. So as you probably know, the HeartMate 2 device has been approved, has been FDA approved now as a bridge to transplant. Again, the way we usually move ahead in the world of mechanical assist devices is devices are first used as bridge to transplants because that defines a shorter time period for which the devices have to be implanted. If successful in that patient population, then we usually extend that to the destination therapies. So whereas we started with in the uh, both bridge to transplant and the destination therapy patients with the XVE, with the HeartMate 1 devices, that was a larger one. Now we have the smaller devices that are non pulsatile that have smaller, essentially hoses that come out of the patient's body that goes to the controller and to the um, battery, um, battery or, or the support, power support that is necessary for it. The HeartMate 2 will show you some pictures of that have, that is just much smaller and much easier and you can imagine this in unfortunately a woman's body much better than you would the earlier devices. What are the biggest challenges of managing these patients in the immediate post-operative state? So in the immediate post-op state it's First and foremost, have we done a good job of selecting for the right patient? Because by selecting for the right patient, we hope to mitigate against multi-organ system dysfunction. The biggest problems being combined kidney, liver, all things that actually have a lot to do with right heart function. Many of these patients go back because they have bleeding complications. The long-term consequences, we still have both the durability of the device as well as risks of infection. Well, tell me about that. What are, what's life like for patients when they go home with this device? So the device that we're using now for the most part is the smaller one, is the HeartMate 2. And all of these patients actually need to be on anticoagulants. When too much is a problem and too little is a problem, risks of infections are an issue. But really, they have to get used to the concept of being tethered to a device, which most people do remarkably well. I mean, the whole issue of patients getting excited by devices, which might have been a scary thought is something that surprisingly has been welcomed. Of course, we've selected for patients who aren't going to, shall I say, flip out with having these sort of things. Um, but we really have to provide for everything, including letters that go to Con Ed, including notification of emergency rooms, police departments, fire departments. But there really has to be, generally speaking, a caring, intelligent spouse at home who can help out with this. When looking at long-term survival in these patients, uh, early reports looked at one year. Have we moved beyond that? Well, we certainly have. I mean, the very earliest study that most people quote, the rematch study, was one that used the first generation. Um, since that time, we've changed things. We have smaller devices, smaller um, tubes that are coming out, which means less of a risk of infection. And so it's really the fact that we're aiming now at durability of the device and looking for devices that can keep patients alive for five years means that at least in a significant group, not all, um, that in a significant group of patients, we've moved to that type of longevity. Well, this is such an exciting part of cardiovascular medicine, and thank you for your dedication in moving the field forward. It's a pleasure.